Hello, welcome to this system design mock interview. Very pleased to say we have a special guest with us today. Uh, it's Eugene from one of our favorite channels, Crushing Tech Education. Eugene, thanks for coming on the platform. Thanks for having me, Tom. Uh, it's great to have you on. Um, now you're going to be doing a classic system design uh, mock interview question with us. Um, but before you do, uh, just quickly give people a, a quick overview of your background. Of course. Um, I'm a senior engineer and a manager. So I started out my career back in 2010 as a software engineer. And over the years, had an opportunity to work as a DevOps and network engineer, engineering manager, and VP of technology. I also have my YouTube channel called Crushing Tech Education, where I post a lot of uh, system design content. The idea for the channel was to create a content that would cover all those deep dive concepts because that was my frustration back in the day when I tried to learn more about it. I just wouldn't find any deep dive content and majority of the videos would be very shallow and high level. So I guess that's my attempt to fix that. All right, let's, uh, let's stop chattering and get stuck in, shall we? Uh, Eugene, today I want to ask you to design Twitter. Sounds good. All right, Twitter, or now it's eggs.com, right? Uh, let's, uh, let's do it. So first, I think uh, I'm just going to ask you a few more questions just to make sure we are on the same page on what uh, components and workflow you want me to cover. So uh, maybe you can provide me some components that you want me to focus on so I can start yeah. it from there. Yeah, sure. Let's, uh, let's look at uh, posting a tweet. Uh, the timeline and user following. Okay, so we want to cover three main features, which is pretty much the main workflow, right? So I post a tweet, and then as a result of it, that tweet would probably go to all the followers that I have, and their timeline would be updated. Um, can tweet contain um, any media like video or photo? Yeah. Yeah, contain links, photos, and video. All right, so we can have any sort of content on that tweet. And when you say a timeline, there's, there are two types of timelines, right? The first one is a user timeline that consists of the tweets that I post myself. And the second one is the home timeline that would be a mixture of the tweets from the users I follow, but at the same time, my tweets perhaps, and some ads, right? Yeah, correct. All right, and uh, do we want to also support that? Yeah, we probably want to support that user can, users can follow each other to subscribe to their updates, right? Yeah. Cool, and do you want me to cover any other concepts like uh, search, uh, retweet, maybe uh, favorite tweets, likes? Yeah, maybe Twitter search, but let's see if we have enough time for that. All right, sounds good. Uh, let me just, talk a little bit about the assumptions that I have and uh, make sure you can stop me if I'm going some wrong direction or uh, we have some discrepancy in, in the thought process. So it's Twitter, right? So uh, all the workloads are going to be a bit heavy because when people go to Twitter, they mostly read uh, and they read way more messages and tweets than they write. And I would say the ratio probably gonna be like one to 10 or one to 20 which means for every single tweet I post, I probably read like 20 tweets, right? And uh, when I post a message, I would need to also likely index it and making sure that it makes it to first the search across the Twitter at the same time to all, the, all my followers' uh, timelines so that likely not going to be instant. And is that okay if we have eventual consistency here? Because I would assume that making sure the tweet makes it to all the timelines and the search would take, I don't know, maybe 10 to 30 seconds. Would yeah. that be okay to have eventual consistency? Yeah, I think 30 to 60 seconds is fine. So all right. yeah. Okay, and uh, so I would also assume that majority of the searches and tweets read would be the most recent data, right? Because that's what Twitter is used for, reading the most recent news and everything. 
Um, yep. And we would also need to store historical data, right? If we do the search, we would still want to search for some data that probably was posted like a year ago. Sure, yes. Yeah. All right. Um, all right, so then if this is anything else you want me to cover or any other comments on the requirements or high level assumptions. I think, I think that's all good for now, yeah. Eugene did a great job taking the question and reducing it into something more manageable. You should clarify the main workflows and use cases that you need to cover. Talk through the functional and non-functional assumptions and confirm them with the interviewer. Then walk through the adjacent features and confirm whether they need to be covered. Please continue. All right, sounds good. Uh, then I'm gonna go and just try to briefly um, do some capacity estimation. Uh, just so we know how much data we would be storing, how big of a storage and network we would need for the system. All right, um, you should be able to see my screen over here. Can you see it? Yeah. So, I mean, the Twitter side, the, the tweet itself would be limited because we can't post a really big, a lot of characters there. It's 160, 160 characters, as far as I remember, or 180. So I think that would probably be like, uh, what, 10 kilobytes max size. Um, so let me just put some high level assumptions. It's 280 uh -huh. characters. 280 characters. Yeah, yeah they, I mean, they, they've moved it up, but yeah, it's not going to make a big difference there. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. So let's just let's just assume like it can be ten kilobytes per tweet maximum, um, and from the user base, how many how many users uh, how many active users we would want to have like one hundred million or one billion? Let's say a billion. Mm -hmm. Billion users. So let's assume we have one billion active users. And um, maybe what, what uh, maybe two hundred million of active users, of, sure. of users that post messages daily, post like daily users call it right. Um, and on average, every user has maybe two hundred followers. All right. So, does it look does it look good to you? Is that does it make sense? Yeah. yeah, that makes sense so far. All right. Um, so let's try to estimate some storage and network capacity that we would need. Um, so, if we have two hundred million daily users, we can assume let's say hundred million users post message every day. So we would have hundred million tweets per day. Right, and um, every tweet would be 10 kilobyte for text, but then you also said that we might have some media, right, in there. So I would assume we would have, let's say, uh, what, 200 kilobyte, let's say, per tweet on average with media and pictures. And if that's the case, then we would have, what, 10 terabytes of data per day. So as we have uh, 10 terabytes of data per day, let's just think how many requests per second we would have. So with this, if we have 100 million posts, per day, and we're just going to divide it by the number of seconds, uh, it would make us, what, 1,200 requests per second. And this would be an, on average. So during the peak time, likely we would have more writes because let's say we'd have five or 10 X more writes, which would make it to six to 12,000 requests per second. Right, 
and um, on average, let's say we would need to send, uh, we would need to propagate those tweets to 20 users, then for every single write, and we have 6,000 requests, 6,000 6, writes per second, we would need to push that user to, we would need to push that message to 20 followers uh, that would make it, uh, what, close to, um, about, let's say, 100,000 fan out messages, which means that pretty much during per second, we would need not only to write six to 12,000 tweets, but also push them out to all the followers. And there would be about 100,000 uh, fan out messages per second. Um, Okay, uh, do you want me to go to the API now or we can skip that? Um, yeah, uh, let's have a, have a look at the API for the timeline. All right. Um, so for the API, I think our API would be relatively straightforward. So yeah, we can cover the tweets and timeline here. So when we post a tweet, then we would just use the post method, I would guess. Um, with the format, uh, we can have a version uh, for the path and then say tweets. This would be our post um, request and it would contain, uh, it would contain, sorry. we would have a, <clears throat> a user ID uh, content and the media. We would have a separate endpoint for the media because we would want to store media separately <clears throat> and then just propagate the link to the media. So there would likely be a uh, different point for the media uh, where we would just post it. And uh, we would have so this is, these are tweet endpoints, then we'll probably have a few endpoints for the user connections. So it would be, let's say, post and delete um, for users to follow each other. So when the user follows each other, we would use post. And then when we break the connection and user unfollows someone, we would use uh, the delete verb. And the uh, API would probably look like uh, this. Uh, we can have like users and then perhaps user ID and then follow. And for the timeline, as you mentioned, uh, we would need get endpoints, right? So we would follow a similar pattern here and call it timelines. Uh, that would probably take as a parameters, we would need a page, page size. Um, we would also need user ID, obviously, but user ID can be passed in the, in the header. And uh, that would be the home timeline. And then there would be a user timeline, right? So it probably looked like this. Uh, user ID and <clears throat> and we would pass the page and page size here as well. So I think this is like high level how the API would look like. Does it look okay. good enough? Do you want me to cover something else here? Yeah, I think that I think that looks good. Okay, so now as we've covered like high level functionality and methods that we want to implement, let's try to define high-level components. And uh, as I think about it, uh, we would need a few components, right? So our main components would be a tweet, pro tweet service or tweet processor that would be responsible for uh, posting a tweet. So when we post a tweet, we would need to store it and then 
post it elsewhere for some further processing, right? And indexing and search and timeline generation. Then the second one would be some sort of uh, user graph that would be responsible for making sure we have all the user connections and that service would be tracking the uh, users that follow each other and, and serve as a source of truth for that. And the third one would be a timeline service that would be responsible for generating the timeline, storing them, and then serve back to users. Um, so based on the requirements, does it make sense what I just said, the components? Yeah, I'm on board with that, yeah. All right, um, sounds good. And now I think we can uh, briefly talk about the database design if you want to, just how the tables would look like. Yeah, I think it would be good to cover the main entities of that, yes. All right. Uh, so, I mean, high level, our database design would be relatively simple, right? We have the main entities would be a tweet that would need to contain a user ID, uh, tweet ID. Uh, we would need to have uh, likely some sort of a timestamp on when the tweet was created and, and the content, right? We might also need to have links for the media, but at the same time, I think those links can be inside the content because when we would return the tweet back to the user, we would use those IDs and links to pull the media. So I think high level, that would be like, uh, that would be it like for the tweet, the basic functionality. For the user relation, we would have some sort of user relation table uh, that would have uh, many to many uh, uh, mapping for users that follow each other. So I would assume we would have, like if we were to use a single table for many to many connection between users, then we would just have uh, user ID, and then, um, and then, uh, or we can call it follower ID, follower user ID, and then the other one would be a followee user ID. So every single time when someone follows an account, we would need to insert two records in this table, one would be for one user to follow another one, and the other one would be for that user to get a new follower. So it's a bi-directional connection that would require us to uh, write two records for a single uh, follow functionality on the, on, on the Twitter. But again, I think it can be optimized a little bit by separation of the follower and followee uh, data, but we're gonna, we're gonna get to it later. I guess once we can go to the main design. Sure. Um, do you think that's kind of good enough for now? And yeah, don't be obviously the user table, right? But it's pretty, uh, yeah, just like high level user information. So I think we can skip it for now. Yeah, I'm happy with that. As Eugene did, before getting into the design, you should draft some capacity estimation for the system. Then you can walk through the API design. You'll also want to define a database design for the main entities that the system will operate. Eugene did all this very convincingly, and he was nicely set up to start drawing his architecture diagram. Please, uh, please carry on. All right, sounds good. Um, so let me just get then to the uh, high-level design and the components. So as you mentioned, we want to cover three main features, right? Posting a tweet, uh, user follow each other, and timeline generation. So I'm just going to go from there and um, going to uh, create a few components here for the user action. So let's say this one is going to be post a tweet uh, like that. Then we would have the second feature, a user follow. 
And then we would have uh, user timeline generation. Uh, so user timeline and home timeline. And I'm just gonna split it like this. So this, these are this, these are would be user requests from the internet. So I'll call it internet. And uh, on the right side, it would be our system. Just to give high level, high level framework. All right. So, uh, do you want me to cover the like uh, API gateway, load balancers, uh, like authentication, authorization, those things? Uh, no, I think we can circle back to those at the end if we have time. I think skip All those right. for now. Okay. So then I'm going to assume that we'll have load balancers. We'll have some sort of API gateway that sits in front of the system. Uh, load balancers as well. I'm just going to skip that and focus mostly on the service architecture, if that's okay. Yeah, great. All right. So starting from the posting a tweet, uh, as I mentioned, we would need some sort of uh, tweet processor service. Um, I'll just uh, go like that. That would... Uh, that would receive the tweet and then make sure that the tweet gets propagated down the system and makes it to the search and other users' timelines. So there's something like that. And this service would also need to be backed likely by a, by a database. So let's have a... Uh, a database here. So it will have to be NoSQL database. And since we want to focus on storing the most recent data, we might as well choose Cassandra because it allows wide rows and they can be sorted by, uh, by time in our case. So let's just assume we have a persistent database here, like Cassandra will likely also need some sort of cache just so we can retrieve records more efficiently uh, if we need to uh, we can have a regis here and um, you also mentioned that we can post media right so the twitter processor would also need to take care of the media that exists in the tweet so we would need some sort of uh, asset service uh, that Twitter processor can call and make sure that the media is handled. So we can call it asset service. And you also mentioned log links. So perhaps there could be a uh, like URL shortener service as well here. A URL shortener. Okay. Just going to put it here. And um, so as we receive a tweet, we would, and if it, if it has media, we would uh, call the asset service and the service would store that media in the, the object storage. So there's likely would be some sort of object storage that would also be exposed as a CDN for quicker access. Yeah, do, do you want me to go deeper into the asset and CDN? No, I don't think, I don't think that's necessary now. Let's All right. Carry on. Okay. So I'm just going to skip it for now. <clears throat> All right. So as we post a tweet, it would 
go to the Twitter processor, if it has a media, like a picture or a video that we would call the asset service, store it in the object storage and receive back a UUID for that media that would later be used to uh, retrieve that me media and return it back to the user. As we store this data, we also need to push it somewhere for future processing and indexing, etc. So I would assume we would have a uh, some sort of queue here. So let's make it a different color here. Uh, let's make it that. For now, we can say it would be something like Kafka, but we're going to circle back to this. So as we get, so we store the message, we return success back to user, and we throw it into Kafka for future processing. And back from Kafka, we would likely need to have some sort of processor that would uh, retrieve those messages and send them either for indexing for the search or for the timeline generation. So I'm just going to call it timeline processor. So that would be a server service that consume messages from Kafka and then and then update the user timelines. And speaking about the user timelines, let's just circle back there. Uh, we would need some we would need a timeline service. Probably like API service that's responsible for serving the timeline. And uh, this timeline service would need to return the timeline to the user pretty much instantly. So we would need those timelines to be cached. So I'm just going to put a Redis cache here. And our timeline processor would probably be responsible for consuming tweets and then making sure that they make it to the appropriate uh, user timeline that would exist in the Redis cache. But again, we're going to drill down to this later. I'm just trying to build this high level workflow uh, that we can follow. Uh, does it look good so far? Yeah. Uh, looks good. Please carry on. All right. Sounds good. Um, so as I'm thinking about the timeline service, right, it would need to pull data from Redis, but we might also need tweets from other from users that whose tweets didn't make it to Redis, perhaps. So I would assume we would also need some sort of service with direct access to the tweets. Because if user is not active, for instance, one might not have the timeline cached in Redis. So we would probably need to just pull it from the database, get the tweets from the database, and then return it to the user. Um, so I'm, I would just like say that we would need to have some uh, to read service, perhaps, just a simple API that sits on top of the tweet data that can serve tweets based on the user ID. So something like that. Uh, this way, our timeline service would have access to first pre-generated timelines, as well as if the timeline is not generated, it can call tweet service and pull the data from uh, Redis and then create the timeline in the real time. It would be not desirable, but we still probably need that. Um, OK. And user follow, that's the last piece that I didn't cover yet. So I mentioned we would have a uh, user graph service, or we can call it that. That would be uh, an API. Um, in front of the database. It would likely need to be key value database. Um, 
I'm not sure about Cassandra. Let's go with just KeyValueDB for now. Uh, that would be storing the user mapping and know about uh, who follows who pretty much. And timeline generation service, timeline service would probably need to have access to this database as well uh, to understand, uh, to retrieve the user followers. Because over here, if I'm a user and I try to render and I open a home timeline, if I am passive user or like not active user, then my timeline might not be might not be pre-generated and I would need to, and the timeline service would need to get a list of followers, my followers, and then retrieve them from the Redis or Cassandra. So that kind of covers that workflow if the timeline is not generated. Um, okay, what else is here? Okay, I think this is high level how it would look like. Let me just work through the whole workflow one more time just so it's clear, right? So when we post a tweet, first thing we do is send a tweet to the Twitter processor. And if there is media, we obviously handle media and we store the Twitter processor to the database and cache. So here, ideally we wanna store in both and use write through cache, but I mean, we want to return 200 k as soon as possible to the user. So we probably want to return 200 k once the data is stored into the database. And then if cache is not, if for some reason the write to cache fails, we would want to handle it internally and not block users on the cache. So once that's done, asynchronously, we also push the tweet to the queue. In our case, let's say it's Kafka. And on the Kafka, we would need to likely partition it. So we would partition our Kafka on the Twitter ID because the whole, I mean, we can partition multiple ways, right? The first one we can partition based on the user ID, but if we do that, then we have a chance that some users can become, become hot and post either too often or in proportionally. And we don't want that. Ideally, the system we want to have is to have as low as even distribution as possible. So in our case, we want to partition on the Twitter ID. So we would push the tweet to Kafka, and then we would have a timeline processor that would consume it and update the timeline. So how would that look like? Uh, let me just try to drill down more into that. Um, so let me, uh, let me just, <clears throat> so let's say we post a tweet, right? We, uh, it gets to the Kafka or our queue. And then from queue, we likely have, that's gonna be our central place from where multiple functionalities would be plugged in. So we, we can have a service responsible for the indexing and search. Uh, we can have different sort of analytics also consumed and processed further. And the main piece of functionality would be, uh, would be <clears throat> would be the timeline generation. And for that, I think what makes sense to do here is that we would have a cluster of consumers
that would that would um, consume the tweets and then they would get a list of followers of the user that posted the tweet and create a list of tuples. Like we can do it in the loop, like we receive a tweet, then we pull all the users that we need to push this tweet to, and we create a tuples with, uh, with the user ID that posted the tweet, user ID where this tweet has to go, and a tweet ID. And then we post all these tuples back to the queue. It can be either the Kafka queue, or I think in this scenario, it makes sense to use uh, Redis channels that act similar to a queue. And from all those channels, we can have those channels per user. From all those channels, we would have a more consumers that would consume it from the corresponding channel and push it into the Redis um, database where the timeline would be cached. So let me just try to draw it. So we have We have a cluster of consumers where the tweet is going. And then we would, for every single follower, we would create a tuple and push it back to the queue. And in this case, uh, we can have, it can be, let's say Redis channels. And now for every single follower, we would have a separate Redis channel that would be receiving tweets from our main queue. And from here, we would have a service uh, that would just push it to the Redis. It would be listening to the Redis channels. And, and push it to the Redis. So the Redis here, would have a format. So what kind of data would it be storing? It would be storing a mapping, key value mapping between the user and a timeline, right? And this mapping can also be, so the way we're gonna, um, so in this case, the user would be the key and the timeline would be the value and the format of the timeline would be a linked list. This way we can very fast insert data into the list and remove it from there. And both of these operations would take all one operation, all one time and would be pretty fast. So does this make sense, the design I wrote here for the tweet processing? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense to me. So I think I've covered here the main workflow. We've covered the posting a tweet method in pretty much pretty granular details here. And the important part is the Redis as well. I think this is a really good optimization by storing timeline as a double link list that would provide us um, O1 insert and delete time. So it pretty much means we can have a linked list of let's say 500 tweets for a timeline. And as new tweets arrive, we can just delete all tweets and it's all done in O1 time in the main memory. 
Um, I think it's also important. So we spoke about uh, being about the system be real time. Is that all these tweets and the whole the main workflow of the tweet is done in the main memory because we don't want to be blocked on writing to the file system or any sort of slow data sources. So ideally, what we would like to optimize here as we're posting a tweet is to making sure that all the communication on the, and operations in the tweet happen in the RAM memory, like fast access memory. And I think we achieve it by, uh, by sending a tweet to Kafka and then perform multiple operations and transformations on the tweet. Then we would store it into Redis channel, which is also mostly stored in memory. And then the final output, which is the timeline, would also be in the memory. This way, uh, majority of users or all of them can just have the timeline pre-generated and updated in real time. Eugene has covered a lot of ground here, so let's take a second to review the steps he's taken. He started with a high-level workflow and made some good decisions, such as using a pub subsystem like Kafka to segregate publishing and processing of the tweets. He did a good job of talking through his assumptions as he worked on the diagram. Constant communication with the interviewer is really important in system design interviews. Once you have a diagram, take your time to talk through it, explain how components work together. Eugene went back and went over the workflow a second time, which helped him catch a few things that he hadn't considered or dived into. When you're ready, make sure you do a deep dive on some of the components. So the bottleneck here, I think, would be the way we partition data, right? Because the main entity of our system would be tweets and we would have like billions of them every single day. So the bottleneck here can be how we store those tweets and how we query them. So what, what options do we have to mitigate against that then? So there are multiple ways here, right? The first one is that it all depends on how we want to partition the data. We can partition it per user ID. So when we store tweet, if we partition it per user ID, we can partition it by tweet ID. And let's, let's think here. So if we do a user ID, right, it means that all the tweets for the same user would exist on the same server. And that is very uh, convenient because we can easily query and get all the tweets for a user. But at the same time, likely it would cause a bottleneck and uneven tweet distribution in our system, which we want to avoid. It would be hard to uh, manage the system because like multiple popular users can end up on the same server and then the server would be just overloaded. So, and as the main entity of our system is a tweet, so I think we should partition based on the tweet ID. But in this case, if we want to retrieve a time a user timeline, we would need to query literally every single server, uh, every single partition, and then get a subset of users from every single partition. So that wouldn't be very convenient. Mm. I mean, the third option here is that we can do a like double, per double partitioning, which means we can try to partition by user ID first, and then partition by the tweet ID secondly which means we would have a like two hash rings of data. Um, so it, it means that if a popular user even end up on the same server with other popular users, they would still be distributed because every single uh, hash range would point to another hash to another hash ring over here. Um, I mean, in theory, this sounds like a doable option, but I think the problem here is that if we want to move some partitions, then it would be just such a complex task. For instance, if we want to move users from 
like this segment to the other segment. Not only we would need to move all this data, but we would also need to move all the data from the hash ring to another hash ring, which is very complex. So I think what we can do here is just a mixture of partitioning by tweet ID and perhaps pilot like this double hashing uh, functionality, which is very questionable because it's just very complex to manage, but it's still an option. Um, am I going in the right direction with this? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, I think I think we're coming coming to the end. Um, just before we wrap the interview up, I just wanted to give you a chance to, you know, think: Is there anything that you'd kind of refine in your design architecture? Uh, just just before we come to the end of the interview. Sure, sure. So a few more bottlenecks or improvements that we can perform here is um, I mentioned the user graph and how we would be storing the uh, connections in, in a single table. So ideally what we do here is that instead of using a single table, we split it into two tables and making sure that one table is dedicated specifically for the user followers and the other one for the user uh, followees. This way uh, we have this bi-directional connection, but at least we can split the responsibility and manage these databases and scale them separately. So I think this would be a good improvement. Uh, at the same time, when there is a user that follows another user, we would need to do two writes to two different databases, which might cause some discrepancy. But from the scaling perspective, that would be a re really good improvements. Um, also, the popular users that I didn't cover. So with this design, where we have multiple queues and this sort of processing pipeline, this wouldn't really work for the popular users, because if I have 80 million subscribers and I create 80 million tuples and then push them to the queue, it would just slow down the whole system. So this workflow would likely be for the generic users that have like, let's say under 10,000 subscribers. And we would also have a list of popular users, whatever the threshold is, maybe more than 10 or 50,000 subscribers, and we would treat them differently. So as let's say if I am a user over here and I want to generate a timeline from and I have and I follow some popular users, then I would get all the tweets from other users through the main pipeline over here. And when it goes to the uh, popular users, I would call the tweet service and retrieve tweets from the popular user from the Redis database and then just plug them into the, my timeline. This way, we can have on-demand uh, requests to the tweets that popular users post. Um, so that's probably a workaround for the popular users. Mm. OK. So I mean, additional improvement that we can make is the way we store tweets because as we mentioned, we'll have a lot of them. And ideally we want uh, those tweet IDs to be unique and also follow and also support like causality, which means that we can uh, sort them by the timestamp because this would be a crucial for our system as majority of our data that we need to keep in memory and store is the most recent data. So whatever Twitter uh, ID we generate, we want to make sure that it's done in a way that is globally unique across the system and also support causality. And um, yeah, so the way I think Twitter does it is that it uses it uses a 64-bit uh, user ID 
a, I'm sorry, 64-bit tweet ID where uh, 64-bit tweet ID where one bit is a signed bit just to make sure that it's compatible to all the languages because if we have a signed bit, it means that the ID is always going to be positive. Then we can have, then I think they have like 41 bit of the timestamp, which are like epoch seconds. And then to be able to scale this ID, so epoch seconds gives us causality inside the ID. And then the rest, we need to make sure that uh, we have enough unique IDs per every single second. So the way we can do here is, this, for instance, we can have 10 bits for the worker ID, because we'll probably have multiple workers generating these IDs, and 12 bits out of increment. Uh, this way, we would support uh, first, we would support the causality with worker IDs. We would support uh, distribution because uh, we would have multiple uh, workers, and we'll provide also HA because if one of them goes down, we are we won't be impacted. And at the same time, if we have uh, more than one tweet per second, we have what is it? Uh, 4,000 uh, IDs per second. So this way, I think we can support uh, what, like tens of thousands of unique tweet IDs per second and never have a, a duplicated ID at the same time support the causality because we have seconds. This way, when for instance we store messages in Cassandra, if we store them in the wide row sorted by the epoch time, then we can only retrieve a last 20 or 100 or 500 of messages uh, without looking at all the older data in the database. And this is, I guess, an additional key point to optimize for the most efficient storage for the recent, most recent data, not for the historical data. Okay. Yeah, that, uh, that makes a lot of sense. Eugene, I think, uh, I think we come, we've run out of time. I think we're gonna have to wrap the interview up there. As you come to the end of the interview, you need to think about the corner cases. So in the case of Twitter, would your system be able to handle uneven traffic distribution with popular users? The most common bottleneck is a database, so talk about how you could improve database performance. Talk about the multiple approaches and solutions that are possible and their trade-offs. Eugene did this really well to round off a very impressive interview. Great job, Eugene. Well done. Um, how was it for you? Did you enjoy it? Oh, it was really good. Yeah, a lot of concepts to cover, so I tried my best to fit it in the time, but yeah, I had a lot of fun. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, cool. Uh, it would have been nice to just keep Keep going, keep going uh, for another half an hour on that. But uh, yeah, thanks so much for um, for doing it, and uh, I think people are going to find that really, really interesting and hopefully really useful. So thanks a lot again, and uh, yeah, hopefully we'll see you back on here Sounds again good. soon. Sounds Cheers. good. Thanks, Tom. Bye. Bye. Hello. Really hope you found that useful. If you did, you can like and subscribe, and why not come visit us at igotanoffer.com. There you can find more videos, useful frameworks and question guides, all completely free. And you can also book expert feedback one-to-one -one with our coaches from Google, Meta, Amazon, etc. Thank you and good luck with your interview.